Welcome to Burn Bright Today, Burn Brighter Tomorrow with me, your quantum wealth and wellness expert, Jennifer J. Marcinelli, bringing to you a holistic healing revolution, eradicating exhaustion and renewing your whole life. Whether you're a corporate executive or homemaker, exhaustion and burnout have no boundaries. I bring over 30 years of wellness and wealth expertise to this hit show, specializing in helping leaders recover from burnout and transforming themselves into the prosperous executives they were meant to be. When it comes to burnout, I have a simple philosophy. When you have energy problems, you need energy solutions. You don't have to accept chronic mood swings and exhaustion as normal. You can go from stress, anxiety, depression, chronic pain and illness to burning bright today and burning brighter tomorrow. Burn Bright Today starts right now. Hello, welcome worldwide Burn Bright Today community. I am so excited you're here today. I have a very special guest, Dr. Mariette Jensen, all the way from the UK, from her home and her office in London. Very excited to have you here. This is part one of a four part series. So you're tuning in to the first show every Monday for the next four weeks. And we are talking about how dealing with narcissism, individuals in our lives who have narcissistic personalities and narcissistic behaviors towards us and around and others around us, whether it's at home or in the workplace. And we're talking about how dealing with these types of behaviors can be exhausting, lead to burnout, and then sometimes can, in worst cases, even lead end of life issues. So, so excited to have you, Dr. Marriott Jensen today, Dr. D Stress out of London. And before I turn the show over and start asking questions, I just like to introduce you to the worldwide Burn Bright Today community, which, and welcome you to the Burn Bright Today community. So Dr. Jansen, as you've already heard, lives in London, resides in London, is in private practice, as an energy psychotherapist, my favorite topic, energy psychology. She grew up in a narcissistic family, and as did I, so we have a lot in common. And just like me, and maybe like you, may not have even really come to understand the full emotional abuse of dealing with narcissism in the home until it maybe even came into our workplace later. She is a published author of multiple books the first of which we're going to be talking about is From Victim to Victor, Narcissism Survival Guide. She has many more, but we're going to take one at a time. Uh, she's an experienced life coach and trained psychotherapist, uh, practices a range of energy psychology teaching tools, uh, emotional freedom technique that we've talked about, neuro-linguistic program that we've talked about, and mindfulness, as well as a few others. She's also, as you know, a PhD in external communications, and she's a columnist for Darling Magazine, contributor to Psychologies Today and Brains Magazine, and she's also published some online uh, instruction as well. So I know there's a lot to this bio. I can go on every week, and I'll give you a little bit more about her next week. But for now, let's uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Marriott Jensen. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jennifer. Very, very excited to be here. Thank you so much. Um, if you don't mind, could would, would you feel comfortable sharing? I know you write a lot about it in your books, and it's on your platform. But could you talk with us a little bit today? I think one of the things that I have found in my work in working with corporations, employee assistance programs, and working with organizations is that some of the underlying exhaustion comes from the how business is being conducted in what can be a narcissistic way, draining, for example. And I have a theory that narcissism starts at home. So I'm wondering if you agree with that or not. 
And where we're going to go with this is if you don't mind, I'd like for you to just tell us a little bit about yourself, your, your journey with narcissism and your experiences growing up in narcissism in the home. And why don't we just start there? If you will, just let the Burn Bright Today community just share a little bit about your journey. Ah, I would love to because narcissism is my favorite topic and the person who features within that topic is my mother. My mother is an absolute narcissist, which I didn't know, I wasn't aware of. And since we spoke, Jennifer, we were saying, oh, you can talk a little bit about your life. I came to realize that my life is divided in five stages. Mm. Zero to 18 is when I lived with my parents, with my mother, uh, you know, as the obedient, subservient child and knowing something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. When I was 18, I disappeared off to university to never return. It was excellent. Uh, but still, I had the, the effect of the narcissistic views. I was 28 when I had my PhD and started to work. And so the, the student years were really the realization that what I had been told about what a lovely family I had was actually not, not the same as what other people experienced. And I, I could look at it from the outside in and thought, mm, something is not right. But did I know what? Of course not. Then I was 28, so that's 10 years later, I started to earn money, I went into therapy, I started to discover that the relationship with my mother was not ideal, but nobody mentioned the word narcissist. And all my therapists were focused on repair, 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 try this, try that, which I did endlessly, endlessly. And then in those years as well, I had a relationship, a romantic relationship with a narcissist. And talking about energy, those years, I was always, always tired. I mean, nothing, nothing was bright and sparkly and everything was, you know, by 10 o'clock in the evening, I just had to go to bed. When I woke up, I was still tired. It was absolutely draining. When I was 38, I moved from the Netherlands where I grew up to London to be with the man I'm still with, the father of my children, and started a whole new chapter. I started to study psychotherapy and got to know more about the human psyche, how people behave together, group dynamics, all these sort of things. Still no answer about my mother, still no understanding about all that. Um, but my studies invited me to do more research. And just by pure coincidence, I came across narcissism and thought, oh, can you believe it? This checklist is written about my mother. Every, yeah, she ticked yeah. every single box. So then I had to go through the motions of accepting, recognizing, understanding more. And when I was 58, so 20 years after I had left the Netherlands, I cut the cords with my mother, finally found the freedom, found the energy, and found a space to write my book. Mm. This is, yeah, this is my yes. first. And in this one is, um, the first chapter is about a dysfunctional family. And that's all about real life examples of what happens in my family. Oh, I'm, so, thank you so very much for sharing that. And do you mind if I just go take a step back because you, there were so many golden nuggets of wisdom in everything that you just described. One of the first things that jumped out about your personal story that mirrors my own was that early zero to 18, where um, we were in perhaps a situation where we felt like we had to be perfect, uh, driven. I don't know if this correctly describes you, but it describes me that where I was in a situation at home where I was to avoid punishment over overly critical, harsh punishment, I had to do everything perfectly. And so it, there was never anything good enough. If I didn't polish the legs on the piano correctly, my, my uh, allowance would be docked, you know? <laughs> so it started very, very young with me. And, and as a healer, I, I would also just like to take a step back for a moment and just make sure that we're on a we're on a sensitive topic and we're talking about what can be by 
by uh, psychological definition, a personality disorder. But we really want to make sure that in this show and all four of the shows that we're doing, that we're coming from a place from healing. And what we're really talking about is our journey through learning about narcissism in those around us and those that we may have absorbed and how it's affected our life, but not with any um, judgment of ourselves or others who, who've adapted these behaviors as, as probably survival. But let's really make sure we take a look at this from healing. So in a couple of moments, we're going to go on a break. And when we come back, I would like to talk a little bit more with you about the zero to 18 and college. What it was like, you know, um, what it was like growing up in an environment where you know we had to be like perfect daughters and how that then translated into college and grades and social anxiety and test anxiety because i understand you do a lot of work with young people and you do a lot of work with test anxiety and social anxiety so if that's okay with you could we when we come back delve into that a little bit deeper because i think this is a huge topic that could be very helpful in healing to, I don't know, 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000 young people who are either the Generation Z or the early millennials who are either in high school today really struggling with schoolwork and social anxiety and test, test anxiety, or maybe even in college. So let's just uh, go to break here for a moment and we'll be back in a few. So Dr. Jensen, welcome to the show. I'm so glad you're here for this four part series. And would you, would you mind sharing with us in a little more detail and any insights that you have about the time in your life from around, let's say high school through college, right around that period, 18 to maybe even twenties or thirties. Cause I think you have just a wealth of experience and lessons learned from that time period in your life and how that ties into narcissism and exhaustion and burnout and what that looks like so would you mind just kind of sharing more about that please mm -hmm. yeah I, I grew up in the Netherlands so in the Netherlands you stay home you go through what is what is called high school I guess until you're 18 and then you fly the nest and you live by yourself and you go and study and you know that's that's the normal age when I was up to 18, I was in the safe, but very unsafe environment of the family, thinking I was my mother's best friend and I was always working hard to do the right things, left home when I was 18. And two things happened to me in those first few months. The first was that I started to become aware that my family wasn't nice, wasn't warm, wasn't supportive at all. I was controlled with money. I was controlled with, I had to come home. I was, there was no, no um, consideration of my position. I just needed to dance according mm -hmm. their their tunes. And the other thing what happened to me was that I realized I had some really weird eating habits, uh -huh. which I had not realized, but looking after myself, I had a, a room, I had a fridge, I bought stuff, you know, with my limited, my limited bit of money. I remember that one of the first days I bought three Mars bars. I don't know if you know Mars, but those yes. chocolate bars. I remember those. <laughs> one in one package because it was cheaper so I thought it's really really good and that same evening I ate all three of them and I remember at that moment that I thought that's actually quite weird yeah that that was the beginning for me the pointer that I had an eating disorder but in those days no one knew about eating disorders and for me it was just wanting to be slim and being on a diet all the time and then binging and then getting rid of the food and then sort of being miserable for a day and then start the next diet and binging session. So those were the two, the two major events or realizations, say, when I left home. And it was really diff difficult because I had new friends there, people I had just met. You know, we were all brand new to all that. I couldn't talk to them about my family. I mean... I didn't even understand myself. So I was processing that. And I, of course, couldn't talk about 
my eating habits because for me that was there was not even something to be talked about. I was just talking about diet. Oh, not a diet. Oh, not you know. I'm going to lose weight. Um, so it was actually a really lonely existence when it comes to it because two really important elements of my life, I had no one to process that with. Mm. And it's very complicated, isn't it? And, and you will know when you start to realize that what you thought was always top, top and always really good, it starts to crumble. Mm. And you think it wasn't good. And how, how are you coming to terms with that? You know, I had um, a similar upbringing where we had to be, you're right, completely at home by a specific time with zero margin for error, no margin for error. And I could remember on an occasion where I was on like a first date. And so this is high school. I'm around just old enough to, uh, just not old enough to be allowed to date. So I was, I think six, uh, must've been 16. Yes, so, yeah. yeah. And we literally had, had to be home. I had to be at home inside the door by 10 PM, no excuses, whatever. And there wasn't even an allowance for a little wiggle room on my clock to hers. <laughs> and we literally, first date, I'm on the porch, just saying goodnight, walked me to the porch. And because her clock said, you know, 30 seconds after 10, she began to embarrass me, flipping the lights on and things like that. And it was very deeply embarrassing that I couldn't even say goodnight or have finish a conversation. And I, and I thought by my watch, I was straight on the clock. So I developed this overdeveloped sense of responsibility and perfection around time. That, you know, if the call didn't, if I wasn't home exactly by then, or if I, you know, and then it, it translated into sales later, where if I wasn't early, I was late. If I wasn't 20 minutes early, I was late. And, you know, whatever you do, don't miss an appointment because somebody would never forgive you. <laughs> so I didn't develop an eating disorder, but I developed a different type of, if you will, a disorder to where everything was related strictly around time. And I was also in the high school band, which was at my time where I went to high school and Cleburne High School was a big deal. We were nationally and later internationally recognized. And to do that, you had to follow very strict rules. So if you were late to band practice, you had to run laps for every minute that you were late. And early before I could drive, um, my, my, my mother, who had a really difficult challenge with timing herself. She was chronically late to everything. No matter what my little sister and I would do to get ourselves to, to get her out the door and drive us to school and get us to school on time, it, she just couldn't do it. So we were chronically late. So by things beyond our control. And then, you know, you had to do whatever you could to get, get your instrument, get on the line on time, or you would out, be out there doing laps, which was you know, terribly embarrassing. So I can really relate to what you're saying because although I didn't develop an eating disorder, I developed something different. And mine was around perfection, around time and performance. Mm -hmm. So I totally feel you. And, and you're right, I couldn't talk to anybody about this because who wants to come over to the house of the girl where everything is so strict? that you know, you're gonna be embarrassed on the porch if it's one minute after 10. <laughs> you know, nobody wants to be around that, right? So it was hard to bring home, it was hard to bring friends home. Yeah. 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 What I later understood, what my eating disorder gave me was that it deflected me from thinking about my mother and the pain and the things that, you know, that I still carried in me. I say about her, she shut my mouth, she closed my heart, and she made me feel the most useless person in the universe. And that feeling, that was so painful that it was better to think about food and planning meals and, and reading about diets and beating myself up because I didn't lose the weight, you know, that whole cycle of right. personal abuse, basically. That's the way you abuse yourself. But... Um, yeah, I was to keep myself safe from the insanity of her and what she had been doing and saying and, right. you know, and what could I do to sort of make changes? Oh, abs them? Absolutely. And I see this in my practice all I, I, a lot. I see this in my practice quite a bit over the last few years. 
because you're right it's not just the behavior or the environment it's also about the energy that's being put out from maternal to child and there are there's a significant body of scientific evidence that actually documents um, by licensed clinicians and and practitioners psychotherapists about how the energies of in this case from parent to child but in this case we're talking about maternal to daughter okay and the energetic damage that we can absorb or can be created when we're in this environment because what they're ultimately doing to put my to put my um, clinical hat on for just a moment is they're actually projecting their pain and whatever it is that they haven't quite worked through yet and they're all trying to do the best they can trying to survive because probably they were in the same environment i know my mom was my mom was um, I'm in the adult child of a brutal alcoholic grandparent. So my mother grew up with a situation that was even far more strict than what she created for us. Far, mm. far, far more strict. And uh, she and her family, and she talks openly about this, and I have permission to share this. Um, she gave me permission to even write about this in my book, is that, you know, her father was um, struggling with his own things, right? And projected it onto his kids that were physical, mental, emotional um, abuse of many type and every type. And how then, you know, that gets absorbed into the energy field. And then my mom doing her best to create a safe and happy, healthy home and protect us from any of that in some ways precipitated it because it's what she knew. It's what she knew. And I'm so glad that my mom and I have had time to now while we're both still alive, be able to work through some of the pain of this from the early adulthood. And I've been able to, you know, forgive her for um, projecting some of this that she was just in pain and it's all she knew. And mm -hmm. of course with me, forgive myself for any time I've done that to any family member or friend or loved one or colleague in the workplace. So I totally feel you, it kind of goes around. And there is also, there's a sequence, yeah? So it was my mother, it was my grandmother who wasn't, yes. you know, I think was very similar. It potentially ran further in the family as well. And I was the one who chopped that sequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was my mm -hmm. my job, I guess, my right. um, my psychic job or what, yeah. whatever word you have for that. But, you know, to sort of do the work, to sort of stop that repeating pattern. Yeah. which meant that I'm the black sheep of the family. I had to be yes. removed and, you yes. know, that's all part of it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I totally get you on that. Um, I have an entire chapter in my book about what happened Christmas Day, 1999, um, standing up for myself and creating healthy boundaries. Um, and in my case, standing up to abuse from a, a sibling, long time abuse from a sibling, um, and I stood up for myself and by standing up for myself and creating those boundaries and actually engaging in physical self-defense, um, I was harshly punished and the entire family, you know, group think, and we can even go into that in another segment about group think and shaming and othering, which of course we're seeing right now in a, in a, on a large scale and what that's like when you're the one who has to break the chain for you and your family and how you can become the outsider and the black sheep. And I don't know about you, but I'm actually, it was the best worst thing that ever happened because I would not be where I am today and gone on to the next level of learning. If I hadn't first back in my, I would have been uh, very late twenties early that that happened. And oh, I was almost 30. So it mm. took a while, it took a while till I could actually stand up for myself. So thank you for that. Uh, let's take a break. When we come back, how about we talk about the next segment of your life? So let's talk about dating and into that uh, young adulthood and entering the workforce. All right, we'll be back in just a few minutes. Welcome back, Dr. Jensen. So glad that you're on the show today because we're talking about how narcissism at home and then later in our our intimate relationships and even in our workplace can just be exhausting to deal with and can lead to burnout and exhaustion and sometimes just complete collapse. So in this segment, let's talk a bit about that period of your life where you began dating and then you know you, the first marriage that you've shared a little bit about and how you work through and identify that you are dealing with narcissism and how you've ended it and then 
gone on from there. So I had the nudge to kind of share a story because, you know, I grew up with narcissism in, a, in one of my parents, that, that my, my direct parent. So I thought that was normal. And what was interesting is I started dating men with the same patterns and I didn't know it then, but now looking back on it, I can really identify. And there's this one date that I went on with this guy that I just thought he was so handsome and he was really intelligent, had a, a really cool position at the hospital in the x-ray department. So he was just really up and coming and really great to hang around, very smart, very intelligent, uh, treated me well at first, I thought. But then we go on this date and this gentleman is a cyclist, like a hardcore cyclist, like in a group and on a team. And he knew that I had no cycling training or ability outside of just riding a bike, riding a bike for pleasure and years, years later, downhill mountain biking. But we're talking or mid twenties when this happened. So we're on this date and we're going to go for a bike ride. But what does he do? He takes me on this, not a bike ride, but a marathon and completely outcycled any of my abilities for cycling or any abilities of my physical ability to keep up with a, a trained cyclist. And of course, what happened is several miles into it, out in the middle of nowhere, I can't go on. My physical body was done. I mean, it was done. My legs were shaking and fried. And it was very embarrassing because then he had to cycle all the way home, get the car and come pick me back up. And that was our last date. <laughs> and now looking back on it, it's like he knew that I, as a trained cyclist, he knew that I was not at that ability and that there was no way I could have um, kept up with him. But he set us out on a date to what? Prove how much better a cyclist he was? I don't know, but it's kind of interesting. So I began, you know, kind of dating that pattern. And of course, I didn't understand it until many years later, but I just thought I'd share that story with you. And I'm, I'm sure you have a few of yours as well. Oh, man. And then and I started dating. I mean, anyone who was kind to me got me. Yes. Because yes. I would do anything for kindness. And yes. I didn't think anything of me. So if someone who looked all right and was kind, sort of was remotely interested in me, I was just off with yes. them. Which opens you up for yes. all sorts of things. Well, we were love-starved, right? We were love-starved. That's yeah. what I call myself. Yeah. I was love-starved my entire yeah. life. And if you then get a sniff of it and you think, oh, there is something there. And then, of course, the narcissist is very good at love bombings. They're really yes. good at, at, you know, showering you with all the lovely, lovey dovey and sort of get you totally in pink and butterflies everywhere yes. before they start the abuse. And the interesting thing is I was in nine years with, a, with someone who was never kind to me, who was always putting me down. Friends were saying to me, why are you with him? What is him and why do you accept that? And I was like, yeah, well, you know, not even realizing that that was so unhealthy. And only later I thought, oh, oh, I get it. I get it. I'm, yes, I call him my boyfriend, but actually it's my mother. So I couldn't make it work with my mother, but maybe I could make it work with him. And therefore, I might then sort of try it again with my mother. It was that repeating pattern. Oh, well, yeah. that, well, it's all we knew. So if it's all you know, how would you know anything else until at some point in time you were exposed to something different and then or some type of training or maybe even a healthy relationship or you get a whiff of a healthy relationship and you're like, OK, what? I didn't, first of all, I don't know about you, but I did not know that I was love starved mm, and I was, no. and I, I did not know it. I did not know that I was love starved and I did not know that I was craving a family. I was craving the family that I didn't have or couldn't have at home and that I later had to leave. So I didn't know that that missing part of my life, that love that I was craving, um, was a, basically a void. And what I didn't understand is that I was constantly all of my life, all the way up until recently, <laughs> filling that void with just what you described, 
uh, anything or anyone that would fill that void that I would get um, respect, love, attention, affection, um, family energy, or, it, or of course, you know, even sexual energy later as an adult. So I didn't even know that I was that vulnerable. I had no frame of reference to understand that there are also people out there that that know exactly how to they're, they're running a formula. They're running, a, they're running a game and they have a, an MO, if you will, of exactly what you described. They know exactly how to read that and how to love bomb you. And then your energy field is reacting and we mistake it for love. I did an entire show on this, but I certainly didn't know it. Certainly not quite funny. Yeah. And, you know, you, they take you in a cycle. Yes. And the cycle is, it's the love bombing. It's all nice, nice, nice. And then it's all going downhill. The tension starts to build up. There is an explosion coming, not a pleasant explosion. There is something there, something that the fear kicks in, the tension is there, and then the explosion is there, and then the reconciliation, and then the love bombing starts again. And it's that cycle what keeps people going, and it's called the trauma bond. And there is a there is a physiological reaction in your brain that sort of goes, it, it's almost like a heroin addict who chases the dragon, yeah? Mm -hmm. And you are in a relationship like that and you, know, you, you notice, if you listen to this and you notice that, step back and think it through and see if you can see that pattern because you might be held then by the trauma bonds. Oh, you are so right, because we are also, we are not only spiritual beings in, in, in a human body, but we are biochemical electromagnetic machines as well. So there are important biochemistry um, interactions taking place within our brain, within our, with our physical bodies, various locations in the physical bodies. And a big part of that, you're exactly right. There are neurotransmitters going on. There are lots of some really good feeling chemicals, uh, biochemicals that are taking place, oxytocin, um, dopamine, things like that, that once we get after we've been starved, it's like the, remember when you got, used to go to the county fair and there was the dancing chicken and you put a quarter in and you, you put the quarter in the machine and, it would, and a chicken would come out and dance and then it would get a food pellet and it would leave. <laughs> So, the, uh, well, we had these at the county fair where I was growing up, right? So this was kind of my dating life. I would come out and do my my jig and get, you know, get some love and attention for a while. And then he gave you just enough of a food pellet. You get the, the, the oxytocin, you get some dopamine, you get a fun, uh, there's a cascade of really cool biochemicals that the, the brain, um, that, that the brain exhibits that you get. And then it's a high and then a low. And you're exactly right. And then they follow this particular cycle. It craters. And so then they're going to do, and you, you're about to leave them. And they'll do something that will give you just enough of a food pellet to come out and make you dance again. <laughs> and because as a victim of that type of abuse, you have such low self-esteem. You don't have the confidence to stand up for yourself. You're not able important enough to stand up for yourself so, you, so you're just in it in it in it well, yeah. yeah or maybe because, even punished for standing up for yourself i was i was not allowed to defend but, myself yeah but doing it in a way that is helpful yeah and in a way to doing it helpful means that you need to value yourself respect yourself and then you can say ho 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 you overstep a boundary here but if you just do it because you think it's the right, you don't believe it's the right thing, but you think if I say this, this will help, then it doesn't come, it's not anchored in you. It doesn't come out, you know, from you. So then it's less strong. Right, yeah. right. And the trauma bond is something, I've got lots of clients who really, really struggle with that because it's so ingrained, it's going on for years and years. Oh. It's unraveling, unraveling that. and. They are still hoping for something. And you say, in these last 20 years, what has, what has happened that justifies the hope in this situation? Is it, uh, um, uh, um, well, actually nothing. Yeah, and that's then the moment to say, okay, if nothing has happened, don't, what is the point of the hope? Right, right. And though that little food pellet for the dancing chicken becomes a half of a food pellet, so it's, they'll throw yeah. you scraps. 
and yeah. to it's really because isn't it really up to us to wake up and realize we're the dancing chicken being thrown a food pellet for someone's whatever enjoyment they're getting out of it whatever you know dr sam backman dr sam backman yeah says it's the three x's s's sex supplier service right i'm sorry go ahead yeah yeah no, well that's why my book is so important i think and i wrote it when i was 60 61 uh and i get you know so and i discovered it at 58 and people are coming to me and say oh my goodness i never knew what was the matter but if you have the tools and the knowledge then people are in a position to make choices and decisions but you need to have that knowledge and awareness no absolutely so when we come back we're going to take a short break when we come back let's talk a little bit more about what's in your first book and let's talk a little bit about you know next steps and what we're going to be talking about on our next show because this is just the beginning this is just the beginning of a four-part series so we'll take a break and we'll be back in just a couple of minutes so thank you dr jansen we are talking about growing up with narcissism in the home that leads to burnout and exhaustion and how that can actually become an incredible journey to come on the other side to well-being and happiness so if you would for a moment i'm really i i i love all of your books but i really love this first book there's there's so much in the different parts and part two the romantic relationship really stuck out to me but i'd like for just for a moment in this particular show today, before we go on to part two next week, what part of this would you like to share with our listeners and the Burn Bright Today worldwide community? I think the most important message around this book is that it's written for you, the victim of narcissistic abuse. It's not about theory. It's not about lots of research it's really sort of you are the source of your own knowledge and wisdom in here and what is fascinating about narcissistic abuse is that it can only happen if there is someone there who enables that right. and i was the enabler for my mother you were the enabler and even though we say well we were only children absolutely right and if you're a child you don't have the knowledge and awareness but this book is for adults then who have the ability to create insights, awareness, look at themselves and say, ah, this is about me and my abuser. And understanding that you have such a big role to play in it means that you have a lot more power than you might feel and think. You're 50% of that one-to-one -one relationship. And there are lots of ways you can take control. And that's a big difference with, say, physical abuse, because physical abuse is just, it almost feels like it's happening. There, of course, some, there might be a build up where you play a role or not. But if someone lashes out to you, there's nothing you can do. If a narcissist lash, lashes out in their emotional way, you can let it go over your head and it doesn't take place. And that was, that's a big, big message in all this with all the other things around it. But oh, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. Pot calling the kettle black here for myself. I've got a closet full of these t-shirts that, you know, I went on and had a, a decades of dating and, and marrying folks with the same behaviors. And you're exactly right. I was enabling this behavior. I didn't know it. I know it now. It was a learning process. We're here to learn. Okay. And I had to learn when I was enabling, because you're exactly right. Physical abuse is different. You have to stop it. But I was taught and raised to accept and allow and excuse and twi I call it the pretzel. I would twist myself into a pretzel to avoid this emotional and mental uh, and spiritual abuse that was coming from any person. And by doing that, I was enabling them and disempowering myself. And I'm, I'm really glad that at 53, I finally figured this out <laughs> the hard way, the school of hard knocks, but um, I totally get it. I've been there. You've been there. I, my clients have been there and your clients have been there for sure. Right. And, and, you know, I can look at it, back at it. And I think it was a gift. Yes. Yeah. And 
I've made it into a gift because, and that's the challenge for everyone here who recognizes their situation. You can change this around yes. and it will enrich your life. It will enrich you. And it will also, all that knowledge will keep you safe for the future because you're so hands-on or so, so on top of it now. Well, I am, you know, it's not going to happen to me anymore. And I pick it up straight away with other people as well. But and it is, it can be really difficult to notice and admit that you're in that position of the victim of narcissistic abuse. And for people who doubt that and want some validation or who just want to talk about their situation, I offer this free coaching call. Yeah, people can go to my website, drdistress.co.uk, click on the link and just book a slot and we spend uh, 45 minutes or an hour together and I can help you to get that clarity. Because that is this very decided. generous. That is a very generous offer. So you provide, I'm just going to repeat it because this is huge, that if, if you're out there looking for, she's offering a free 45 minute coaching session, guys, this is huge. You just don't get this from one of the foremost leaders in narcissism. She's a licensed psychotherapist and energy healing. And I really invite anyone who feels like this might resonate with them, go to your website. We've got the website up and book that free coaching session. Because if you even think this is something, if you're feeling exhausted, if you're feeling burned out, if you're concerned that you might be being victimized, there's hope and there's help. And it all starts with you asking for help, right? It, it starts with each of us to go and ask for help. All right. So... <laughs> and on that note, on that note as well, asking for help, it's, you know, we're not coming to this world with a manual, isn't it? This is how you have to live your life. And there are plenty of people around who are experienced in niche areas, like, like you are, like I am. You don't have to know everything yourself. And it's, right. it's a, a token of respect and self-love, I would say, to recognize that not everything is in place. And then to put your hands up and say, who is here to help me? Help me, please, or find that help. Well, you're right. And I know that there's a, I'll have to get the research, the full book title, but it was, I believe, called Perfect Daughters. And I'll get, I'll put it in the details and I'll post the link to the book. But it was a, a really good book about Perfect Daughters and how this is where in order to avoid emotional abuse or any type of abuse, it could be physical, a part of what we did is think we have to know everything up front. And I was held to exceptionally high standards as a very young person. I had to parent my parent. I had to parent my younger sibling. I had to work 35 hours a week all through high school. I had to pay for my own car, my own insurance. So I had a lot of tremendous um, responsibility at a very, very young age. And that in itself can be exhausting. <laughs> And it, you know, it kind of becomes this vicious cycle. So I think this is a really key thing um, that will lead us into part two of this series of what we'll be talking about next week. And, and you've set up for us a four part series and part two is going to be about recognizing narcissistic behavior. So in the next few minutes, would you like to talk a little bit about what's coming up for the next show? And any other uh, bits and pieces you'd like to provide for our listeners before we finish off today? Yeah. Yeah. So next, next week, we are going to talk about recognizing narcissistic behaviors and tendencies. And a lot of people don't recognize how serious certain things are. They say, oh, it's okay. Oh, this is, oh, this is what people sometimes do. Oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, it's, and it's not important if it matters or not, but it's important that you clock it as something that is not healthy and that is not positive and that you have to be on the lookout for. Because if you recognize these things, then the puzzle comes, the jigsaw comes together, isn't it? So that's what we are going to do uh, next week with some examples. There you say like, ah, really? Oh, can't believe it. Because this is so funny. In some of those talks and networking, and so when I do do shorter talks, it's, people afterwards say to me, ah, oh, this is what my mother-in-law used to do. Oh, and all the other things as well. Now I can see how she was actually a narcissist. So that's quite... Um, uh, 
it will be quite amusing, I hope. <laughs> um, what is the message that I want to give at the end of today? I would say for anyone, if you are in a relationship or if you come from a family and you think it doesn't feel right, you know what? It isn't right. It isn't. So trust your gut feeling because you are carrying all that wisdom and knowledge in you if you can access it. Yeah. Absolutely. You're right, because this is about the journey from burning out to burning bright and building a better, brighter future for tomorrow is all about self-empowerment and accessing the inner wisdom deep within us that we all have and accessing that part of us that is divine. And that can be really, really difficult. Like you said, when your mouth has been closed and your heart has been closed, it can be really difficult to be able to access these, these other parts of ourselves that then lead us forward into a brighter future. So I know I've been there, you've been there, all of our clients have been there, and we've got a lot of people that are building better, brighter futures for tomorrow because of this information. So I am so very grateful you've been on the show today. Very much looking forward to part two next Monday, recognizing narcissistic behaviors. And we're going to come at it, live examples, and we'll even have a little bit of fun with it. But you're also going to leave with some tools to help recognize it in your life that will empower you and help you find a place to heal. In the meantime, if you're looking for immediate help, give Dr. Jansen a call. Reach out on her website. It's posted here. And sign up for that very generous free coaching sessions that she's offering, right? Take her up on it. So thank you so much for your generosity. Love having you on the show today. And head on over to burnbrighttoday.com for all of the updates and the new platform. And we will be here, same bat time, same bat station next week with part two with Dr. Mariette Jensen from Victim to Victor Narcissism Survival Guide. Burn bright today, my friends. Take care. Thanks for listening to Burn Bright Today with me, Jennifer J. Marcinelli, so you can burn brighter tomorrow. Burnout can feel like a heavy cloud hanging over everything you do, but a holistic healing revolution and a life you love is within your grasp. Catch me next Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Central, 12 p.m. Eastern on TransformationTalkRadio.com. To learn more about me and to schedule a quantum healing session, visit burnbrighttoday.com. See you next time.